Welcome to See You on the Other Side, where the world of the mysterious collides with the world of entertainment. A discussion of art, music, movies, spirituality, the weird, and self-discovery. And now, your hosts, musicians and entertainers who have their own weakness for the weird, Mike and Wendy from the band Sunspot. It's the last podcast of 2017, Wendy. Oh my gosh, and it's been a great year, hasn't it, Mike? I think it's been all right. Now, when you think about our first podcast of 2017, or what was our last one of 2016, we were talking about Carrie Fisher passing away, oh. and uh, I still haven't seen the new Star Wars, so don't say anything yet. Well, I haven't seen it either, so. Okay. Some, but I do plan to soon, very soon. I think some jackass ruined a big spoiler for me on uh, internet discussion board in a completely separate discussion the other day, and so that kind of made me mad. Um, so if you're the kind of person who does like spoilers on unrelated topics, uh, I don't know, put your hand in a fire, but <laughs> <laughs> and never type again. Um, oh. Anyway, but the thing is, so in the Carrie Fisher episode, we were discussing about the kind of, the kind of things that we wanted to make happen in 2017. And my goal was to do less. Yeah, that's right. How'd that go for you? I failed. Aw. Sounds like you need to refresh that goal, Mike. <laughs> I failed in doing less, except for uh, in, in the big ghost tour months, September and October, I did end up doing less and gained uh, 12 pounds. Congratulations. Thank you. So I can't say that I didn't get anything from 2017 because I, I, got, I got an extra uh, spare tire. Well, that's not nothing. That is, right. That is something special for the year. But anyway, so everybody that had stuck with us since the beginning of 2017 and people that have been listening since 2014 when we started, I got to say it is episode 176 and we thank you very much for spending uh, your time with us. Yes, I always appreciate that so much. So uh, now it is the day after Christmas today. And Wendy, did you have any Santa sightings? Uh, I didn't see Santa, unfortunately. However, he did deliver some gifts. So he was there. I he was there. Him, but okay. He, he was there. So yeah. How about you? Well, I only saw him and I, I saw his image all around the house because now uh, Adeline can say Santa. So, they, uh -huh. so she sees Santa. She's like, Santa? Santa? So and she, she saw Santa. She sees Santa everywhere. Any man with a big gray beard or a big white beard, Santa? And it's always a question. You know, like she's like, oh. That's cute. Well, she needs you to confirm. I did. And so I confirmed for her. And so Santa did come to visit. I didn't see any elves, though. However, the man we're about to talk to, he might have seen some elves. Whoa. Okay. So the guest on this week is, is John Tenney and John's website, Weird Lectures. He does talking all over the country. Uh, he's been a researcher for Unsolved Mysteries, a writer, uh, fascinating character. We met John at the Michigan Paranormal Conference this year. Yes. And I have to say it was one of the most fun conversations I've ever had with a person upon first meeting them. Yeah. Because he just went right into it from one weird topic to the next. He did. And, uh, <laughs> I'm like, this is an interesting person that I hope I can become friends with because, wow, I mean, knocked my socks off. Me too. Well, within 30 seconds of meeting John, he's telling a story about meeting Father Malachi Martin. And he has a whole, like this, you know, whole Amazing thing story. on right on Malachi Martin. And I'm just like, <laughs> holy crap. And so that we tried to bug him as much as we could throughout the weekend <sighs> and, and went to all of his presentations. But uh, yeah. so John is a lot of fun and uh, he's out in the... Detroit, Detroit suburbs of Royal Oak, and he's got some great stories. And uh, we had seen on Facebook that he had a, some very, uh, well, not necessarily strong opinions, but he had a lot to say about the recent UFO article that was in the New York Times on yes. December uh, 18th, the big thing that came out in the New York Times. So uh, we wanted to get John on the podcast to talk about it. So let's see what he has to say. Joining Allison and I tonight is John Tenney, weirdo extraordinaire, paranormal expert, spellbinding storyteller, and supernatural Seamus, who runs weirdlectures.com. He joins us today to talk about the recent shocking UFO news that appeared in the New York Times. John, all the way from Michigan, welcome <laughs> to see you on the other side. <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So for the people that haven't uh, heard you or been to your website or checked out one of your lectures or seen you at a paranormal convention yet, what's your quick elevator pitch? Like, how did you get it to be a professional weirdo? 
Oh, it's it's not quick, uh, but I'll try and condense it as much as possible. When I was uh, si- when I was sixteen, I was a gopher for my mentor, who was a specialist in political assassinations of the nineteen sixties and seventies. So RFK, JFK, MLK, Malcolm yeah. X, Black Panthers, all of them. And uh, as I assisted him with his research and learning how to deal with the government, uh, I became. For, to make it as short as possible, I became more interested in the kind of underlying octopus that seemed to connect all these weird conspiracies. And when you would read about uh, secret government organizations, you end up reading about UFOs. You end up reading about mind control, ghosts, um, experiments with hallucinogens, all of this type of stuff. And I was like, well, maybe I should track where my heart is telling me to go. You know, Craig, my mentor, his was assassinations and mine was the weirder stuff. And so by the time 1990 came around, I was doing what I was calling weird lectures because I felt like if I was, you know, at one time I did, I did, I had lectures that were, okay, this is a conspiracy lecture. This is a ghost lecture. This is a cryptozoology lecture. But then I found myself kind of locked into only being able to talk about that one issue. And that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted people to do, I've said it for a long time. I've wanted people to diversify their weirdness. And so if I want to talk about ghosts and how it relates to ufos and how it relates to cryptids and how it relates to uh folklore like i should just do weird lectures and then i worked for unsolved mysteries in the 90s and on a bunch of weird shows in the late 90s and then of course as everybody knows in the 2000s reality shows hit with paranormal and here i was i'd already had you know at that time 15 years experience and so the network started tapping me to do research and then here we are now, almost 30 years later, and I'm still trying to figure all of this crap out. Well, I'm really excited to talk to you today because, you know, as as you alluded to there, you know, you really make a lot of connections between these seemingly disparate phenomena. And so, I mean, I think that's what, what we really need uh, to try to figure out what's, what might be going on. So what you know, if we could just jump right in, you know, what do you think is going on with with um, this news of late uh, from the New York Times, um, which basically outs a, a program uh, going on um, from 2007 uh, till at least uh, 2012, although some argue that it's still going on right now, uh, a Pentagon uh, funded program looking into UFOs. Only twenty-two million dollars went into it, which which is not a lot when you're talking about defense spending. But like that's the Pentagon wallpaper budget. <laughs> yeah, that's not, it's nothing. It's really nothing. Right, but what is something is that they were looking into cases that have impacted the military that have been reported by military pilots. So you know, this isn't the stereotypical, uh, which is is really. You know, stereotypes are vile, but you know the the idea of some farmer out in his field, you know, some local Yahoo who you know sees something. Uh, you know, these are trained pilots who can't explain what they've seen. Right, it's not just some jackass in the middle of Wisconsin looking up at the sky, <laughs> going, hey, "Yeah, what's that there?" You know, they can well, you know have what? violet sightings also. But you know what? To start, before we get really deep into the New York Times, what's interesting is that. You know, when you were, Alice, when you were about to say not to, you know, and you went to farmer in a field. Right. Like the reason that we all think that is because in the 1970s, the Department of Defense sent out a little memo to the three major networks. There were only real, you know, ABC, NBC, and CBS at the time. And uh, because of this huge sighting that had happened in 66, 1966 in Michigan, the they sent out a, a little memo to the, the three news channels and said, like, it would be most beneficial for your network and your advertisers if you are going to do an unidentified flying object or flying saucer story to not interview anyone that has above a high school education. Mm-hmm. And so throughout the 1970s and early 80s, the only people that you saw on television reporting UFOs were the kind of uneducated masses. And so that's the idea, even to this day, now, you know, 30 some odd years later, we jokingly say like a farmer in a field, a wacko in Wisconsin. And that was, again, driven, that was driven by the government and its use of the media. So now we're, we're in another area right now, which I've always said during my lectures, 
Paranormal phenomena and supernatural phenomena, it's because of the way our society is, is very cyclical. So uh, in the 90s, when X-Files was on, the UFO community was exploding like it was everywhere. Everyone was researching UFOs. There were tons of UFO documentaries, Bob Lazar and the Aviary, and there was all of this stuff going on, the Benowitz files. I mean, Alien autopsy. Alien autopsy. It was exploding. Disclosure was eminent. Uh, you had all of these people coming together, doing press releases at the United Press Corps in Washington, D.C., and then it died. And then all of a sudden there were ghost shows. And then for 10 years, ghost shows exploded and everybody's hunting ghosts. And, and this happens over and over again. And then ghosts die off. Cryptids come in. Bigfoot and Mothman blows up like crazy. And now as that waxes down, here comes UFOs again. And I've watched this happen since the 1980s. It's, a, it's just circular. People's attention spans. I mean, it was longer before because people seem to have a longer attention span. So it was taking you know, 10 years for this to cycle through. Now it's only taking, you know, a year or two years to recycle back to the next weird thing until a generation gets sick of it, tired of it, they don't think about it anymore. Now we can move back to ghosts. Now we can move back to Bigfoot. Now we can move back to UFOs. Wow, what a perspective. Yeah, so, I mean, you are saying to us that, you know, that whole uh, stereotype that we have was engineered by the government using the media as a tool. And so that's really interesting, especially since, you know, doing a little bit of, you know, reading on my own in the field, you know, I know that there's been surveys done of pilots uh, and there are many, many reports of um, UFOs or, uh, you know, unidentified aerial phenomena is now the, the more fashionable term, you know, that that have been seen by pilots you know, for decades. And and so I think it's interesting now, the distinction now is that the New York Times comes out and says, hey, it's not a wacko from Wisconsin, it's uh, military pilots. So could you speak to that distinction a little bit? Because, you know, and releasing, like, you know, for the government to release some some official footage, I mean, of a UFO, ostensibly. I mean, what does that mean? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it means as much as people believe it to mean. So even to a certain degree, there are there are laws, uh, local and state laws, that, to, to, before I get into all that, there are local and state laws which allow and disallow certain professions to even talk about the fact that they've seen UFOs. So if you're an, a commercial airline pilot and you see a UFO, if you report that, you have to undergo psychological testing. You can have your license revoked. So you just don't report it. Uh, it's the same thing with a lot of uh, police officers and law enforcement officials. If you report an unidentified flying object, you have to go in for psych evaluations. You have to talk to internal affairs. So police people don't talk about it, you know. So it does seem like a big deal when someone who's in an official position comes forward and says, yes, this stuff might be real. But I know the reason I don't think it's big news is because – they have always done that. You know, we found out about, uh, you know, Project Sign and Project Grudge, which were started in the mid to early 40s, because Edward Ruppelt, who was a military official, said, we're studying UFOs. And there was footage that they released that they couldn't identify. And, you know, even though their footage was taken from an amateur, it was still footage that was vetted by the government and they released it and said, we don't know what this is. And then, like I said, you know, the 50s, 60s come around, it kind of gets lost. People forget about it. The 70s comes back around. Now here's a little bit more footage. Now this person says this over here. And, and so this is just more of, I really feel it's like more of the same. It's, it's just a way to either make people look in a different direction about what's going on politically or socially in the country or, uh, you know, sometimes things leak out and it doesn't just mean that something great is coming. Sometimes information just comes out mm. for, for your listeners. So wait for your listeners, if I can just a yeah. real brief history, because mm-hmm. people are, people are like, you know, well, oh my gosh, the government is studying this. So for your listeners who aren't well versed in UFO lore, right? So you have Roswell in 47. In 1948, the United States government creates Project Sign to investigate UFOs, government sanctioned. Sign um, is stopped in 1949. It becomes Project Grudge. Grudge 
uh, goes on until 1952. Then it gets recalled Project Blue Book. Blue Book goes from 1952 and ends in 1970. So, I mean, I don't think people realize that it went on that long. Mm -hmm. So we know for a fact that they're interested in stuff. And then when Project Blue Book ended in 1970, there was a brigadier general named uh, General Bollard who said in the final closing statements of like, we're shutting down Blue Book. And then his last comment is, we'll continue to take reports and investigate them. So even though he's closing down the official project, he's still saying, we're still interested in this. We're still going to look into it. And, you know, so, so there's, there's no doubt that they have had stuff going. People are just crazy right now because they're like, oh, they admitted to doing it. They've, they've admitted a number of times that they've funded money into stuff that was quote unquote weird. Yeah. And so this isn't really a big new thing. Even aside from UFOs, if you look at all of the weird stuff that the government has funded research into, so you have Blue Book ending in 1970, but in 1970, what else is going on is starting in 1953, you had the government's doing MK Ultra, which was mind control experiments on soldiers. MK Ultra went until 1973. Um, and then, you know, in 1978, you've got Project Stargate, where the government is looking into remote viewing and, and psychic powers of, of people. And then that whole, you know, Project Stargate, which became Project Sunstreak, that went into 1985. So the government is always looking at this stuff. I mean, they do have interest in it because we have interest in it. And they want to know if there's something there that's weaponizable, if there's somewhere there they can make money off it. I mean, that's the other thing about that New York Times article. You know, we're looking at technology and alloys and recovered, like, it's right. going to be it's going to be used to make money. So if it can be used to make money, like, we're going to investigate it and figure out who can be in control of that thing that's going to make money. Right, because, you know, in the article, you know, that was one of the things that jumped out uh, in one of the articles. That was one of the things that jumped out at me was um, that uh, there were certain buildings you know modified to hold recovered recovered uh parts essentially yeah uh, and and we don't know what that means by modified i mean they might have just by modification they might have just built a faraday cage inside of it so that you oh, know yeah. people couldn't leak but that's it like that's all the modifications they could have or put bigger locks on the doors yeah we don't know what that means by modification right, right. it doesn't the, mean the, force fields the significance right. is that you know essentially it seems like they're saying we have pieces of alien craft that we've been studying or they have pieces of top secret technology from other countries that they've been studying and that's what i was going to th think about here because is there any particular reason like you know um one of the things we talked about in our first conversation with robbie graham and his book the silver screen saucers was about the idea that the cia wanted us to believe in area 51 because that the idea of that we are weaponizing alien technology is the idea is to um, right to to scare the nesting dolls right out of the Soviets, and so if if we have this kind of tech, you know, from space, it's going to be terrifying, and so that's why they wanted us to they, they want us to believe that kind of narrative. Now, what kind of narrative could be construed? from the release of this today, besides the fact that Harry Reid wanted to give the price of a mid-level, you know, film to his buddy in the Bigelow Tech. I mean, that's, I mean, it might just be that, right? Like, it could just be guys dealing with their buddies and saying, listen, I can get you 22 million, like, no one's going to blink an eye at it, because it is the wallpaper you know, budget for the Pentagon. Those earlier, those those earlier government uh, projects that I was talking about, like MK Ultra. MK Ultra in 1953 had a 10 million dollar budget. So adjust, adjusted for today's dollars, that's 85 million dollars that they were spending a year on MK Ultra. So now you come up into our day and age, and they're like, "This is 22 million dollars," and people really do. There's a lot of people who act surprised at that number. They think it's a huge number. They don't realize the black budget of the Pentagon is hundreds of billions if not trillions of dollars and so that 22 million dollars could easily just be oh you're interested in ufos i'm interested in ufos i can get you this 22 million uh do what you want so what's important 
to find out like what the motivations might be about it is since it is taxpayer money, since it's now been disclosed, and, and I, I posted a, a thing about this, I think, on Twitter, and I think I even wrote uh, to Allison about it. But you know, the first thing I did was I immediately started writing Freedom of Information Act requests. Because they're openly talking about it in the news. They've told us the people that are involved. They've told us the budget that's involved, which is taxpayer money. It's all funded through taxpayer things like the Department of Defense and the the Defense uh, Intelligence Agencies. I need to write FOIA because all of these reports that were mentioned in the New York Times article, those are ours. We paid for them. So if they're willing to discuss them openly, if they're willing to send the reporters and the people and Bigelow and everybody out into the news sphere to do interviews on CNN and MSNBC and all of the news channels, you should have no problem with giving me the reports that you created with the money that we gave them to fund this this thing with. And so people should be writing FOIA requests like mad right now, like not just reading. I mean, those are your documents. Your, you, the, everybody that's listening to this paid for those reports to be made. Well, I teach fourth grade and I think I should get my fourth graders on it. Absolutely. I'm serious. Yeah. I hey. mean, I, you know, I joke, but you know, I am serious because uh, I do my best to get them involved in government uh, at as early an age as possible. And this is something that we should all know how to do do you think at 11 years old, though, they can handle the truth? <laughs> I think they can. You know what's great is that if you go to weirdlectures.com and there, go to the search box and search FOIA, F-O-I-A, you can copy and paste. There's a template for a, a FOIA request, and you can plug in what you want to look for. And you could give that to your students and tell them, what, what do you think the government might know something about? And they can each write in in that little blank spot what they want to – do they want to know about um, – you know, UFOs, or do they want to know about submarines? Like anything they want to know about, they can ask the government, send me the information about it. And it's a, a letter that they can send and put one stamp on it. And they'll get a letter back from the government, either saying, yes, here it is, or we're taking on an earned advisement. And I mean, it's a really cool thing for a kid to have yeah, I'm doing a it. letter a letter from the FBI or for the, from the Department of Defense. And like, oh, someone in the government is doing yeah. something. Even though mostly it's going to be uh, like, why aren't Kit Kats in the food pyramid? No, no. I mean, they're they're pretty astute. But um, <laughs> yeah, we've been working, doing a lot of work um, with, with our local government. So this would be a cool, you know, a way to segue in, them into uh, federal government. So I'm definitely doing that. Thank you for... Uh, I'm excited about the template. And and you should you should tell them too, though, to, I mean, this is the other thing for your listeners and your students, is to know that... You know, okay, so they might get some documents. They might get the a rejection letter saying that we don't have anything about what they've. But then, then they also might get a letter that says, you know, the the we're looking th- for your request and it might take some time. So, like I have Craig, my mentor, and I, we filed Freedom of Information Act requests for Kennedy files. Now, you know, they had that big Kennedy dump where it was all the files mm-hmm. that they ever had on Kennedy. Craig and I still have not gotten responses from some of our FOIA requests that we filed back in 1986 and 1987. Um, They keep sending us letters every three or four months saying it's still under advisement. We're still looking for it. Uh, So, I mean, they they do have stuff that they won't release. I mean, that's the other thing you have to, to look at, too. And then why won't they release it? Yeah, those are all compelling questions. So what what do you think? I mean, okay, so you mentioned, uh, hey, the 22 million, you know, maybe it was like some kind of uh, deal uh, between friends. But, you know, I do know that, you know, Robert Bigelow, uh, the billionaire who is involved in, you know, the study of this, of, of these, uh, you know, materials, uh, and, you know, they, they've also interviewed witnesses uh, and, uh, you know, done medical s- studies about their exposure to the UFOs um, and then interviewed pilots, uh, you know, so that they did do some work uh, regarding that. And and I know that Robert Bigelow, he, he's been into this subject for decades. So he's not a newcomer. Uh, you know, and, and people who aren't familiar with the subject might not know his name, but, you know, I've heard his name for years and he owns uh, Skinwalker Ranch where, you know, he's been doing uh, experiments there and some of the high strangeness that, that's been experienced at that location. Uh, but also before that, he had the National Institute for Discovery Science, uh, NIDS, and uh, that was an organization that he, he ran uh, to 
explore this kind of stuff. Uh, and he financed it all on his own. And that, that ran for a couple of years. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, right, that a billionaire needs $22 million from the government to investigate something that he's already been investigating for 30 years with all of his own money. And he needs this amount of money, which to a billionaire isn't, again, it's not very much. Right. So so it really does seem at one kind of real low level where you have a billionaire who's interacting with senators and congressmen, uh, which is mostly the only people who interact with senators and congressmen, right? And and Bigelow says, I'm, I want to do UFOs. And so the senator gets him some appropriated money. This is what happens at every level of our government, except it's usually in the oil industry or the mining industry or the you know coal or, or the, uh, other technology industries. Like it's a billionaire saying to a senator, I need some money to investigate this. Yeah. And then I can use the fact that the government's, you know, providing me funds for it to kind of push our agenda. And so the other thing we're not talking about either is DeLong into the stars, right? So yeah. uh, he's all wrapped up in this too. So give give a little background to the listeners about Tom DeLong and to the stars. Yeah, so Tom DeLong is, you know, uh, was a member of Blink-182, still is or whatever, and has all of a sudden in the past, I would say, I mean, so Blink-182 people will say he's always been interested in UFOs, which is fine. I completely believe he's always been interested in UFOs. Uh, people have been. Uh, you know. But when people say, I'm a lifelong UFO investigator, like, when did you really start investigating? Not reading the first book about UFOs and watching documentaries, which is what a lot of people do. And so maybe in the past five or six years, maybe seven years, all of a sudden Tom DeLong has burst onto the scene saying, I'm going to create this organization called To the Stars. We're going to do disclosure. We're going to show alien technology and we're going to bring it all to the forefront. Now, again, I have to be wary of this because it's cyclical. Like I've seen people do this before. You know, this happened with, like I said, the Benowitz affair. If people go and Google that or you look at what Bob Lazar and when Area 51 was in its prime in 1994. There's all these people who show up and they have all of these real lofty goals of disclosure. You know, Greer has been in the midst of disclosure now for 30 years. Like, Stephen Greer yeah. has been about to disclose alien technology for 30 years. He's on his own timeline. Yeah, yeah for sure. And his own planet. Yeah, and so DeLong... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, so, a little editorial so DeLong, comment there. So DeLong shows up, you know, five or six years ago, says, I'm going to do disclosure. And now this is happening. Of course, he's aligned. He's a millionaire, a multimillionaire, long be yeah, who is friends with a billionaire who, if I was a millionaire, I would have a lot of billionaire friends too. And <laughs> I'm sure one of those billionaire friends would probably be Bigelow. Because right. you run in that circle when you have that amount of money. When you're a rock star with hundreds of millions of dollars and you own a lot of stock, I mean, people don't really understand that Tom DeLonge didn't make most of his money through stock or make it through his band. He made it through like his parents' corporation that he invested, you know, all of his rock band money into. And it, he's a money guy who happens to be in a punk rock band. So, I mean... It's wealthy families dealing with each other. I would have, like I said, I would have those connections too. Your listeners would have those connections if we were huge money men like that. Well, hang but on a second, John. Um, could you speak a little bit about, because there was a Rockefeller involved too. I forget his, his name exactly. Jay? Yeah, but uh, until his death, he was very interested in UFOs as well. So, you know, there, there have been moneyed people interested in UFOs before. Yeah, and that's not, like, crazy, right? Because you have not only <laughs> – you have people who are interested in UFOs. It's an interesting subject. And some of them are going to be millionaires because people are interested in UFOs, and some people happen to be millionaires. So you are going to get rich people who are invested and interested in – in UFOs, flying saucers, even Bigfoot and ghosts. Like, that's just going to happen. And but how it doesn't. How can we get them to be our patrons? That's the real question. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's the same way of saying, like, how, what you literally just said is, how can we get them to give us their money? Rich, <laughs> Absolutely. rich people, rich people are rich because they don't give anyone their money. That's right. 
<laughs> okay, that's a good point. But, you know, it's like, how do you get that gig? Like to be in the, the National Institute of Discovery Science or or to, you know, work for Robert Bigelow investigating uh, UFOs. I mean... Do you really want to be at the beck and call of uh, an eccentric billionaire, Allison? I'd like to try it for a I while. Mean, oh, I just, I mean, just think about that. I mean, have you ever worked for like a weird boss oh, who all like the time. makes you right, yes. who makes you do weird stuff? It's like he needs he needs his specific kind of coffee at all one a.m. All the green M and M's and only green M and M's. <laughs> right. And well, actually, that that Van Halen story, we'll have to tell the full story at one time. It's not as right. crazy as you think. OK, but <laughs> well, uh, no, no, the point, the point. But, being... but the idea is like, would you want to work for an eccentric billionaire who's like, hey, Allison, you're going to be able to study UFOs. But at two thirty, I need you to rub my big toe with Vaseline. <laughs> like that's the kind of life you got to lead. Yeah. Yeah. But the point is. You know, we talk about the paranormal and how it's really sad that we don't have enough funding to to do this uh, full time. And, you know, here are people who could fund you. And it's it. So, you know, these people who could fund themselves, what are they doing? They're asking the government for more money. Yeah. Yeah. Tom DeLonge is like a Kickstarter for his to the Stars Institute. Yeah. Like he's got to ask the regular guy for five bucks a piece when he can just take the you know the royalties off that first Dude Ranch album or whatever and put those into it. Yeah, I mean, you, you guys have a point, but my point is there is some money going from these people uh, to the study, ostensibly to the study of these phenomena, and you know I don't see that as a particularly bad thing. I mean, it's. It's uh, different than, you know, having TV fund you, which is, you know, they they want certain things and you're not going to get any truth out of them. And maybe, you know, it's a pipe dream to think you get any truth out of anybody. But uh, I I just feel like I'm glad that at least someone's looking into it or at least saying they are. I'm glad that people are looking into it. I'm glad that people are spending money on it, that certain people are funding it, that taxpayers are obviously funding it. But I think what's inter- but I think what's interesting is that like you you don't know if behind the scenes like what's actually going on. That's the way it is even what you were saying Allison with television, right? So it's like if someone did come to either of you and said, "Listen, we can fully fund your research into uh Bigfoot for 10 years. Like what do you need? We'll give you a million dollars a year for 10 years." But while you're doing it, you can't tell anyone about it. You, um, if anybody asks you about it, these are the answers you have to give them. You have to obfuscate. You have to get around it. You have to lie to everyone for ten years. Are you? Do you take the money? I think I do because you do. Yeah, because I want to know personally. And, okay, so so yeah. there's no you don't there. So the altruistic part of it is gone. So it's as long as you know, you're fine. Well, I, I just. I don't see any other alternative. I mean... So you're doing all this great research. You're doing all of this fact-finding, all of these studies and all these reports. And when you get up on stage, because people ask you to lecture, you make you make stuff up because you're not allowed to talk about what you're doing. And when people ask you questions that are close to the answers that you're finding, you lie to their face and tell them they're wrong. Yeah. So that you can have, so that you can have some money and some satisfaction. No, no, it's it's not the money. It's... It's the, you know, the knowing, the being able to do the research and and being funded to, you know, to be able to devote yourself to do the research. And it's sad. It would be sad if, you know, you wouldn't be able to release that information. But, you know, at least the research would be getting done in a sense. And you you hope it's going to be released at some point. Well, I take the money because I'm a whore. Like, are you, are you <laughs> well, kidding? Um, that, um, a million dollars a year, you half a million for research and half a million to party. Well, the other thing is, too, is you're going to have to document every dollar that you spend. Yeah. You're going to have to show exactly where it's going right. to. And and the the ultimate reveal could be that at the end of, the end of 10 years, when you hand over your research, someone goes, thank you. And they throw it in a shredder and no one ever sees yeah. it ever again. Well, that's the problem because drug dealers don't give receipts. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's a it's a quagmire. I'll give you that, but I'm just saying, you know, ha- having having money to be able to do this full time. Uh, I mean, there's value in that rather than you know just trying to do whatever you can on weekends. So it, it's it's a Sophie's choice, you know. What are you gonna do? But right. 
I think the idea, though, is that, that the truth, and, and here's the, what we're talking about in, in, in the greater scheme of things, I think, here. So you take something like this, and we get a, a little kernel of evidence from this government report or things that come out like, oh, yeah, we've been running this project for, we ran it for at least five years. We spent $22 million on it. And here's what we got. We got a grainy video. We've got a mysterious alloy. Uh, we have somebody to trot out in front of the public uh, to say that, yeah, I saw a weird light in the sky, just like half the you know jet pilots did in World War II. It's not like uh, you haven't heard or or seen a an interview with a World War II pilot out there that hasn't been like, yeah, I saw something crazy in the sky when I was bombing the Jerry's. You know, when you when they're talking about these things, like we know that people have seen things. We know. So what's the point? Like when you, we want to talk about the point of it is that there's some kind of kernel of truth or a story that's fed to us right now. And why is it being fed to us right now? And for what purpose? Like, is it, is it to make us not look at the tax bill that's just been... That's, that's, what I, that's what I argue is like what you just said, right? So he, all of a sudden it's released this information in the New York Times. Okay. There was a government study going on. The government funded the study. Here's a grainy video. And here's someone saying that we have a uh, weird alloy and maybe some recovered technology. Okay. What did we have in the UFO community before New York times came? We knew that the government had been funding studies in the past and spending millions of dollars on it to study UFOs. We had tons of grainy footage. We had people who said they had alloys and recovered technology. Like what, what did we gain? Like all the only thing that we learned is that, Oh, it's not 15 years ago. It's five years ago. Like that's all that was released. Like that's all, the only difference between now and five years ago or 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Like the only difference is now people are saying, oh, but it, look, it was recent. But you know what? Like when the government announced that blue book came out, people were like, oh, look, it was recent. Like we're still at the same place that we were. I said it on my Facebook post, like, you know, crappy grainy film footage of a ufo whether it comes from a guy in a field or the government is still just crappy grainy footage of a ufo like give me some context if you're going to disclose something then disclose something don't keep feeding me a kernel at a time every five or ten years show me what you have and until someone is willing to do that I I don't really understand why it's such a big deal. And I, I do think that it is obfuscation. I think it's a way to get people to look somewhere else. The United States is in a very tumultuous state right now. Like, who knows how our political system is going to go in the next couple of years. It's whether it be the tax bill or who's running the government or who's not running the government or corporations and their money influences into the government. Like, there's a lot going on in the world right now, and, and this was a great way, you know, the second most viewed story in the New York Times for the past, you know, four days has been that UFO story. You would think that people would be more worried about if they're going to be able to, like, go to the doctor next year. And the thing is, okay, so $22 million spent on advertising in television, magazines, the internet, etc., would not get the kind of press that uh, they got from releasing the story. You know, $22 million still is going to get you a the second most viewed story on the NewYorkTimes.com or that kind of feature where it's talked about on CNN and people come on each of the news stations. So you got to say, when it comes to the government, uh, and everybody talks about how the government wastes our money all the time, whatever they were trying to accomplish with that story is $22 million well spent. <laughs> Because here yeah, we are absolutely. talking, you know, we're all yeah. talking, we're all talking about it. And they may not have discovered UFOs, but they certainly uh, changed the conversation to um, what they want us to talk about. And there's a real weird psychological aspect too, uh, to to kind of do a callback to how we even started. How do you create um, a kind of branching system where it does seem like you have crazy people and it does seem like you have knowledgeable experts, right? So every time either of the two or you or me or any of our peers in the community, if we were to go on television, whether let's say for a Roswell special for our local news or a Halloween special on ghosts for our local news, anytime any of us would have gone on television, they would have kicked off our interview segment by playing either the theme from Ghostbusters or the theme from the X-Files, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Right? But Every single time. Every single time. But 
with this, the, the way to create division is now you've had multiple people on major news and cable stations, and they don't play the X-Files theme song. They don't play the Twilight Zone theme song. They don't play the Ghostbusters theme song. They bring them in as a knowledgeable expert in the field. That person will be looked at more regarded their opinion than ours because we're the silly people. We're the we're the ones who have spent, you know, our whole lives kind of down in the in the in the in the trenches trying to do some good work. And you know, I, I it, it was a good story that was in the New York Times. You know, Leslie Keen shows up on CNN and talks about UFOs. They don't play the X Files theme for her, you know. So, like, there is a way to even create new branches of well, this person's crazy, that person's not. Look at the difference in how we're treated, even in the media. Yeah, that's sobering. I like where you're going with that because it also goes to show that um, the medium you know, is the message, you know, to, to quote Marshall McLuhan there when you, it's like how you see it when you see somebody talking in the talking head on TV, uh, if they come on and it sounds like an entertainment segment, you know, like mm-hmm. it's going to be AC Slater talking about whatever new movie Ryan Reynolds is in or something like that. Right. Versus if it's going to be a news segment that frames the way you look at every single thing. And when people come, you know, if somebody comes on and talks about UFOs and it's in the like the that last 15 minutes of the news or that segment yep. that's right after sports, you know, people are going to be like, oh, no, this is this guy's funny. No, we want to watch that's this. That's the puff this is piece. Movie. Right. Yeah, that's the puff piece. And so sure. your placement in the newscast can be uh, can say as much and can, you know, have as much impact on the veracity of or the perceived veracity of your story as, as almost anything else. And so it's, it's hard not to be, you know, defeatist about the whole thing. Um, and so I, I think it's good that even though we're, you know, we're, we're challenging the fact that they released this at this certain time, what's the narrative people are trying to push Tom DeLong's out there trumpeting it and anything that he trumpets kind of has the, the, the stench of BS about it somewhere in the back. Um, because maybe because of his association with entertainment, maybe it's because, uh, his band was mostly just power chords and fart jokes, but like all those things put together just makes it. And I like Blink-182, but I like power chords and I like uh, poop jokes. But the thing is, is that... <laughs> I, I do too. <laughs> <laughs> Full disclosure coming right now. <laughs> Full disclosure. Yeah, I thought they do were Do you like poop jokes? <laughs> but to what you're saying, like it's, it's what's interesting, right? Because what's, what you're seeing is, again, another part of the kind of cyclical process of these things revolving. Because in the 90s, you had cancer that broke into these warring factions. You had these, yes, these people believe Bob Lazar. No, these people don't. It happened when the MJ-12 documents came out. Yes, these people believe them. No, they don't. And then in the internal factions fought. So what you're going to see happen, and it's already started, in the UFO community is people who are on the side of Tom DeLong to the stars. We should really be invested in them and really interested in them. And then people saying, be wary and be cautious of them. And now those two factions on inside are going to fight. And that adds to the obfuscation of whether or not we get any answers. Cause now we're going to infight about this New York times article for the next three years until something else drops another little kernel. And then we can start fighting over that and say, well, I was right about it. You were wrong about it. And so it keeps the internal groups divided. Right. So what should we do, John? I mean, what is what is the path that we should be taking to to get out of this cycle? So it's it I mean it really is like caution. Like take your time, read the article. Okay, now read about the people in the article and read multiple things about the people in the article. You know, read things that you disagree with. We live in a such a strange world like I don't want to I never as a, as a person who researches UFOs, like I never wanted to know about the air intake scoop on a 1953 F9C Scorpion from Northrop Grumman. <laughs> like I didn't want to know about the mechanics, but I wanted to know what I was talking about and I wanted to know every aspect of it. And so you have to be voluminous in what you want to know. And, you know, so like the first thing when Tom DeLonge uh, announced to the stars and did like his big announcement that the website was starting and that you could back it. And he was talking about like, I think Alonzo, which is one of the guys who 
you know, is all wrapped up in this New York Times story. Like the first thing I started to do because I was like, oh, I, I'm, I think I have a file about that guy. So who is he? So I like ran upstairs and I went in my cabinet and I pulled out my file on him. And there's this just a, a five or six sheets on him. But it was when he got fired from the the defense intelligence agency department that he had been worked in because they were spying on American citizens without going through the proper channels to doing so. And so his agency got closed down for spying on people. And I was like, Oh, I, this might not be the greatest guy to have in your disclosure movement. Like he, he's already kind of tainted from working in a government organization that was going against like the, the kind of ways and means and checks and balances of how you should be treating Americans. Right. Now he's going to say, oh, I'm, I'm part of this savior group that's going to give you all the true information. Mm. And so it really is just about reading about the characters involved, looking at the context of how they're involved into it. What did they do before they were involved with this? And, and looking at the history of the movement. I mean, people would realize that it is like, I can't say it enough. Like it's a cyclical thing. It happens over and over again. Maybe it's because I've been doing this for 30 years that it's so easy for me to see, but like, it's just happening again. And it gets really frustrating to tell people like, okay, it's, it, it seems like it's huge and it seems like it's big and we all want disclosure and we want proof and we want evidence. If they announce tomorrow, I mean, this is what people have to be prepared for. And it, it's very sobering. If they announce at the end of this year that there are extraterrestrials that we are in communication with, you know, people always say like the religions of the world would freak out. <clears throat> Maybe, but it fundamentally changes humanity for the rest of history. Our place in the universe, everything we know, everything that we will ever be will change. If So you're telling me that you think, you know, people who are like, up oh, disclosure is eminent. It's going to happen at the end of the month. They're doing it before Christmas. They're going to do it next year on, on January 1st. Humanity is fundamentally going to change, as we know it, forever in the next three weeks or four weeks or a year. Like, that's just not how the power structures of the Earth even work. Like, if it was going to happen... It would have happened. Nobody would control highly advanced extraterrestrial aliens that, that come to this planet. They're not cutting deals like uh, a, a corporate CEO. They're not, they really aren't. I mean, you know, you have stories about, oh, the UFOs landed at an Air Force base and they made deals with Truman and to give him technology. And why? Why would they do something like that? I mean, the, the idea that a, a a civilization of people who can traverse all of time and space and the inky blackness of the cosmos with some kind of technology that to us seems like magic, pull over to the side of the road at our planet and start cutting deals with one guy from one nation on this entire planet is nonsensical. Well, now we've got the president who wrote the book on it. So he's just going <laughs> to, I just, I want disclosure to happen because I want Donald Trump to go off prompter when he releases the information. Like, as far as, I mean, yes, he might botch the whole thing, but the entertainment value alone oh, of man. Donald Trump doing disclosure um, would be one for the books. These are the greatest aliens. <laughs> they have the most mass. They have the most massive ships. <laughs> they're, they're huge. They're, These, they're huge. Their ships are huge. <laughs> greatest uh, ships in the universe right here. Oh we're gonna, my God. And we're going to build them in Michigan. The last, right, yeah. The last person that you give any UFO information to is the president, though, right? I mean, in all honesty, the long, like a president is going to be in office the longest for eight years, right? right? So you don't give him every single bit of information, especially if it's something about alien technology. I mean, you know, even if he asks, I'm sure there are levels of security that even the president doesn't have. People don't want to believe that, but, you know, you're... The, the chances of a president even serving eight years is rare, you know, a double term for a president. Like he, that guy might only be in there for four years. You're going to give him the keys to everything that you, that you have, uh, secret wise. Let's if he's only going to be, there. <laughs> yeah, let's hope not for sure. Yeah. Especially in the current case. Um, so you, it sounds like you think John, that there's never going to be disclosure. They're, they're never going to, disclose because it would change human history is this what i'm hearing i i think that 
if I have to make a guess, which I have to. Um, <laughs> We're going to hold you to it. Your feet are uh, to the flames. <laughs> I think that, I think that um, disclosure has been happening. I think it's been happening for centuries. And I think it's happening in a way that an advanced civilization would disclose themselves to us. Slowly but surely, uh, through the winding of the Dark Ages to today, are, we have psychologically become more equipped to deal with uh, a culture that is unlike ours. Uh, the conversations have elevated. Our science has elevated. Our, just our, our personal day-to-day interactions with each other have elevated in a way, mentally, where it seems to me like this is what disclosure is. Like every, It's not this massive bomb drop from a government agency that there's aliens. It's slowly the two of you start a show and someone else has a podcast and a blog going and someone else is writing a book and we're talking about it and we're discussing the ideas and we're constructing the ideas together. And it's revealed to you like reading a book. It's a page at a time. Um, and, and the book is already there. It's just we're slowly reading it as a, as a society. I think it's happening right now. I think that there are probably advanced civilizations interacting with us and have been. And I really feel like slow and steady wins the race. They're not in a rush and we have things to do and they would understand that. And that's how it's happening. So you think that it's not the government, but the, whatever this, uh, alien intelligence is, uh, you know, be it extraterrestrial or ultra terrestrial or what have you, you know, it's revealing itself to us and, and we're coming, we're coming to it, you know, kind of individually and as a society as well. And it's not coming top down. It's, it's almost coming bottom up, I would think. Yeah, for sure. And, and I think that one of these things that's po- very possible with like this, these reveals that come out every few years is if there are people studying this phenomena and they're looking at the trends of what people talk about and believe, which they also have been studying as long as they've been studying flying saucers, what do people believe? Uh, they would notice that there has been a, a, an uptick for as long as there have been UFO sightings or, you know, this type of phenomena that people have believed more and more. And it seems like the government uses this as a way to say, oh, yeah, we know about it. We've been studying it. Look at this. We're in control of it. That's uh, something that our yeah. that's something our society does. That's so something they just kind of jump on it and act like, oh, oh, we've had a handle on this all along. Yep, we've yep. already cut a deal. We've already <laughs> there's a deal on the yeah, table. Yeah we've, yeah, we've known about this for a long time. Don't worry, we have it under control. We've got we've got we've got the best guys on it. The biggest guys, the best guys, <laughs> the most massive guys working on this. <laughs> Top. They're man. huge. But that's just something you say because. What else can you do? What else can you do? And they like to be in control. They don't right. like to seem like they're at a loss for, well, we don't know what to talk about. We don't know how to address this issue. So, John, let's talk about, you know, what what do you think that, well, what do you think is going on? Uh, you know, what do you think these craft are? Uh, you know, are they extraterrestrial? Uh, are they um, from another dimension? You know, what is going on? What do you think? And a good way, a good way to lead into that, actually, well, that's, I mean, that's, that's the big question, but a big. good way to lead, lead into it's that huge. question is what I'm interested in, it, it's huge. <laughs> what I'm interested in, John, is as far as when it comes to maybe a UFO story or a, a story like that, what's the most believable one you've ever heard, I think would be, a, a, I think a good way to start or one that you're like, yeah, man, there's got to be something to this one. And that might color your perception of, you know, what you think is the truth behind the phenomena. The reality, and to be as truthful and honest as I can be about it, is the the most you know mind bending story is mine is the is my sighting is my experience because I'm the person involved in it. You know, I've talked to hundreds of abductees and hundreds of contactees and experiencers of all shapes and sizes for thirty years, but you know there was that one night when I saw something that I couldn't explain and. I still don't know what it was exactly. And as I've read and become more knowledgeable, it's only become weirder and more deeper to me that these things exist. I I, I don't think that you can find 
you know, you can find snippets of truth and you can look at jigsaw puzzle pieces from other people's experiences, but it's when you start to experience something, I think that's kind of what I was talking about when I was talking about disclosure, like as, as when people start to have their own experiences, that's how things are disclosed and revealed to them. That's when their eyes are cast open, you know, is when they have that experience. It's when disclosure and- is personal. Right. And that's when it means the most. And so, you know, when people are saying, I wish they would disclose, what they're saying is, I, I wish that they would make it so everyone else believes me. Um, mm. and, and I think that that's important to remember. Like, if you know that they're there and you know that something is going on, then you're okay. Like, you're, oh yeah, that's, I, I already knew that there are UFOs. I already know that there are ghosts. I already know that there are monsters and interdimensional beings and ultra-terrestrials. Like, I'm glad that you know about it now. That's what disclosure is. Okay, now you know about it. Now I'm not crazy, which is permeates all of these fields that we investigate, right? Like we talk to each other because we find our commonality in weirdness and then we don't feel so weird. We feel connected to those around us in in, in a much deeper way. Oh, thank goodness you had that same type of experience and, and there's that release. And so... I think if you're secure with your experiences, yes, of course you still want to share with other people, but the idea of disclosure isn't so transformative. Because you've already been transformed. So I want to hear your story, John. Yeah, that's what, let's, let's, oh, it was, you wound up the no, pitch, come on. <laughs> it was very, uh, very subtle. I was uh, standing in an alleyway late at night. I was working a midnight shift. And I was out there smoking, standing in an alley in a, on a Wednesday night in a darkened city. And I was the very clear night, and I was looking at the moon because it was one of those nights when you could see everything perfectly on the moon, just clear sky. And beneath it, in the dark sky, there was just a shape. And I thought to myself, that bird is soaring in a very weird way. Like, that's a weird bird, which is the exact thought I had. And I had, I never, I didn't never looked at it. I was kept looking at the moon and after it had probably gone a few inches in my line of sight, in my peripheral vision, I could see it underneath the moon. I thought to myself, well, it's really weird that someone is flying a kite this late at night. And I kept looking at the moon and then I thought to myself, why isn't that plane making any sounds? And then kind of, uh, maybe a second or two seconds before it disappeared above the buildings, I finally stopped looking at the moon and I looked right at it and it was a kind of roundish triangle, uh, but no sharp edges. And it was black, it was very big and it was moving through this dark sky, but it was darker than the sky, which is how I could see it. And it kind of moved over the top of the buildings. I watched it silently disappear out of my sight. And then I turned back and I looked at the moon and I thought, Man, that was a really weird thing. I wonder what it was. And then, two or three minutes later, snap. And I was like, holy shit, that was a UFO. <laughs> now, here I, and here I am at the time. I mean, by that time, I had already been lecturing on UFOs for 10 years. And the thing that sold that sighting for me was that when it happened, the last thing I was thinking about was that it was a UFO. And I really feel like, and I've talked, like I said, I've talked to tons of experiencers, contactees, abductees, tons of people who say that sometimes when you see things, it really does feel like there's a kind of mental block on you to not see it. Absolutely. I I would have to agree with that. Yeah. And so, like, it's so mind boggling to me that here I am, this guy who studied UFOs for 10 years, is watching a UFO. And the... Only things I'm thinking about is bird, kite, airplane, and then only after it's gone do I realize I've just watched this giant, crazy craft moving silently through the sky that has no traditional shape to be flying in our skies, that that's a UFO. And I was like, oh, I just saw a UFO. Yeah. And I mean, when th- when I, I think... Um... You know, I've been doing this for a while, and I think after you do it for a while, you can get pretty jaded uh, because you realize, you know, just how fallible people are in their descriptions. And, and you know, if you're not having experiences yourself, you know, then you kind of 
doubt everything. And I was at that point. And then thankfully, uh, thankfully, I've, I've been starting to have some of my own experiences. But, you know, what you say there about, about, you know, this mental block, and I'm not sure if it's the phenomena doing it. Um, I, I, I more think that it's, it's like our own inability, even though, you know, I'm like really into this, right? When I see crazy stuff, it takes me a while to process it. I don't yeah. automatically just say, oh my God, look at that. You know, I, I'm i like, I, it's it's really strange. And I've had things no, happen and, and didn't talk about them for days afterward. I completely agree. And what's interesting, and if, you know, we did have kind of a combinatorial field of study, like we would realize that it happens to ghost people and it happens to cryptozoologists that there's a moment where something extremely bizarre is happening and you're just standing there kind of glassy eyed watching it happen. And then after it's over is when you go, holy, that was weird. Yeah. But you don't, you don't seem to really be able to process it at a time. Like you were saying, Allison, it's such a a delay. Yeah, it's such a paradigm shift that your brain is kind of locked up in what is happening to my reality right now. And we're really programmed, too, to just go back to conventional reality. Oh, got to go to work, you know, and and not to think about what just happened. I mean, it's and I that kind of gives me hope because, you know, like I said before, I mean, I there's a time when I was really sick feeling very cynical about this stuff. And um, now I feel, you know, I've had scant experiences. You know, I haven't seen the mothership or anything like that. But, you know, it's something I've seen things I can't explain now. And I can finally say that. But uh, I've realized in that experience just how fleeting uh, these things are. And they don't often have like a predictable narrative. Like, you know, we've kind of been trained into, you know, with ghosts and UFOs that there's a certain narrative that you expect. And, you know, if that's not there, I think it's hard for us to hold on to it. Uh, again, it's also hard because, you know, we are programmed to, to just see a certain part of reality and just to, you know, kind of drone on to work. Um and so a lot of, I think a lot of people, you know, I think there there might be more people than we realize are having experiences like this, but, uh, you know, I'm supposed to be open to this. So this is supposed to be, you know, my life's <laughs> pursuit and I still have problems with it. So that really gives me hope in a way because I, I'm thinking, wow, this stuff could be going on all the time. And, you know, if I'm, if I just almost flush this stuff from my memory, you know, what is it like for, you know, the common Joe? For Joe Sixpack. For Joe like Sixpack. What, what happens to him? Yeah. I'm the same way. I'm, I mean, I'm the same way. Because I'm a researcher and because I want to be even keeled about it, when a weird experience happens to me, there is a moment after that moment where I start to explain it away to myself. Yeah, I've done that too. And I forget, you know, I talk about a lot of different things at my lectures, and I often forget that we're animals, right? And so when you were talking about being programmed, we're being programmed, we're, we're programmed as humans, but we are animals, right? So when I take a moment and I go outside and I'm sitting on my porch and I'm watching my my non-human animal friends in the neighborhood, you know, dogs and cats and squirrels and stuff like that, and I watch them react, like it, my analogy is when you watch a squirrel, it's eating it's eating its peanut on your back deck or on your front porch or whatever. And you move toward the door, maybe open it, and it catches the assumption that you are coming, right? It freezes, and it has this look on its face, and you see it in dogs, cats, you see it in all animals that you might normally see, where their reality could, anything could happen at the next moment. Like, the look on their face is like... Am I going to die? Am I going to fly? Am I going to be kicked? Am I going to be, am I going to lose this peanut? Do I have to run? Do I have to, like, it freezes, just like we were talking about. Like, that's how we're supposed to be. We're supposed, when something happens, we are supposed to be like, oh, is reality about to shift? But because we've been programmed as humans, we're like, no, I have to get up to go to work tomorrow. We're already forward thinking past 
this weird thing that might be happening or this thing that's currently happening. We're making all these, you know, millions and multitudes of judgment calls about things that, you know, these experiences that haven't happened when the, the kind of default position is that, oh, anything can happen right now. And we've lost that ability as humans for people to be able to do that. If you say like, oh, you know, it's possible, it's, you know, possible that you could see a ghost and people are like, no, I've never seen a ghost. Like you have to be open that reality is about to hand you a tsunami that you're not prepared for. And I feel like human beings kind of lose that sometimes. And it's kind of a beautiful way to be like to live in the moment, like a squirrel or a dog or a cat and kind of be like, oh, this is this weird thing that's happened to me. Someone just walked out, this giant creature just walked out on a porch <laughs> and, and yelled at me. Like, that, that that happened today, and now I'll go about the rest of my day. It's just really interesting, the psychology behind all of it. I doubt stuff, Allison, that happens to me all the time. I never will stop doubting it, because I yeah. know that the brain, I know my brain can be tricked. I know that I'm a fallible human yeah. being. I mean, I think it's good to apply critical thinking, but, you know, I noticed that for a while I was really going the too far the other way where I was just discounting everything and you know you don't want to do that either you don't want to just explain away uh and and I I think I I've done that to an extent and now I I'm more like nope I know something happened that was weird that's never happened before you know I compared it to this and that nope it's a thing you know I I've started to realize there there are things like that and I'm really happy to, to be able to say that because, boy, I've, t- I've <laughs> torn things down like you wouldn't believe. And, and now there's certain things that I, I'm still holding on to. But for a long time, we were just dealing with people who kind of were saying things all the time that felt unbelievable or everything. Like, you know, it wasn't yeah. just like one thing happened to him. Every single thing happened to him. Right. And, it, and they didn't try to back up it with research or everything. And they were making money on it. So you, right. you have to have a skeptical eye when you're like, well, I get this person's trying to sell something. So <laughs> yeah. so every I, so everything's real. I, you know? Yeah. Um. So, John, like uh, one of my experiences is... um. I, I was asked to speak at a notoriously haunted place in uh, Baraboo, Wisconsin. And so, again, it's a place where the owner realizes that ghosts are good for business. And, right. and, you know, that's great in a way. But, you know, I'm used to being in Milwaukee where, you know, if you want a story, you got to pretty, pretty much pry it from somebody's dead hand. You know what I mean? It's like... It, it's like they're really ashamed of their ghost stories here. They're really worried about letting it out. And and it's hard to get people to admit stuff. And But then once you get it, it's like, wow, I really got something. You know, when, when there are people who are like, oh, man, this place is so haunted. It's a portal. We've got 20,000 ghosts. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, yeah, it's really hard for me to really think that a place is haunted. So they asked me to come and do like a two-hour lecture about Uh, weird stuff in Wisconsin. And uh, so I got done with my lecture and then uh, we were going to do the podcast there. And so I had to set up and I was like stowing my stuff under a table. And then I stood up and what do I see flying at my head? But a quarter size white orb with my naked eye and it flew past my, my ear. And, you know, I like looked, I'm like, what was that? And this is one of those where I didn't tell anybody. Uh, even they had a, a documentary uh, that was being filmed there, and I was interviewed for the documentary. You think I would have mentioned it then, or you think I would have mentioned it during the podcast, or you think I would have mentioned it when we were doing the so-called investigation, um, which I had problems with because uh, I didn't think there were real investigative techniques happening, but that's just me. Um, anyway, I didn't tell anybody about it until that was a Saturday until that next Monday when I called Mike and I said, Oh, by the way, Mike, I did see something. And and, and I, I immediately gaslighted her. I was like, <laughs> You didn't see nothing. No, stop you, it. You, stop it with your hysterical you stories. But but uh, I think I had a problem because I was like, this place is not haunted. How could it really be haunted? And then to top it all off, I see an orb, which, you know, the, the whole orb thing has irritated me, you know, to no end over the years. And but you, when you see it with your, your naked eye, I mean, that's something different. 
Um, so that was one of my experiences and just, you know, going through the psychology of experiencing it and, and like the delay, uh, and it's really interesting, like the stages that you go through. So, yeah, uh, yeah that's one of my personal experiences and, uh, it has a little bit more of a narrative because it's kind of like a poke at me. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's kind of like, uh, you know, the spirits are telling me, you know, get off your high horse and stop uh, critiquing orbs so uh, so vehemently as you had or something like that. But, you know, it's, it's, it's funny because when you do have, you run into those people, and I'm sure we all have, where you were, something happens to them every single day or it happens to them four or five times every night, you know, and you you have to like... Is that really happening that often to them? I tell people all the time. I do the podcast that I do, which is called Realm of the Weird. It's mm-hmm. it's which 14, I love. I love it. <laughs> and people are always like, "Do more episodes." Yeah, I know. And I'm like, That's what I was and, just gonna say. And and I tell people all the time, like it took thirty years to get those fourteen stories. Yeah, because those are from <laughs> like, your real cases. Yeah, and like those are the fourteen or fifteen weirdest things that have happened to me in thirty years so like when someone comes up to me at the end of the night and they're like i have 172 evps tonight like uh. i caught uh, i got i caught 52 ghost photographs tonight <laughs> during the investigation it's like did did you really like i can't i mean i want to believe them but you know i also have to get into that position where I t- people say like oh can i show you that this photo of my dead grandmother's ghost and i have to be like okay but like, yeah. do you want do you want it to remain being a photo of your dead grandmother's ghost, or do you want my honest opinion on what it could be? Yeah, because, that's hard. And and a lot of people will say like, oh, well, don't look at it then, and that's fine. You know, my the the end. I wrote in a book once. If all of these things aren't real, if ghosts aren't real, and there's no Bigfoot and Mothman and Chupacabra and Loch Ness monster. None of those are real, and there's no such thing as ghosts, and there's no such thing as aliens and UFOs. If all we're doing is telling each other stories, that's fine. Like, we're talking to each other. We're listening to each other. We're telling each other what we feel and how we think. If, if that's all all of this is, and no one's hurting anyone, and we're just sitting around telling each other about the things that we think about and our concerns about this world and the afterworld and what might come next. That's beautiful, and I'm fine with it. Well, it is beautiful, John, but I'm going to ask you <laughs> to to maybe tell us what you really think about, you know, what are these creatures? I mean, what, you know, you, you said that you're developing, you know, this these connections, this, this unified theory of the paranormal. You know, what do you think is going on? What what are these things that we're seeing in the sky? Or, you know, what are these creatures that, that we see or interact with? My kind of patented slogan, right, that I put on everything is what you think is weird is weirder than you think. Like I say that at my lectures. I have it on a bunch of my websites. And the kind of philosophy behind that is that our reality is much wider than we experience, that there are more worlds and more colors and more sounds and more things than we might be capable of currently experiencing. And I think that every now and then they touch our reality or we get glimpses of them, and that's what these things belong to. They belong to a much, much wider and weirder reality than we're currently experiencing in this seemingly shared reality between each other um you know if there are beings from outer space that exist in this reality at the same kind of geometry that we exist in that's fine uh i understand that i i I could see how the math would work on that that there's biological beings just like us somewhere else out in the cosmos that might come and interact with us i see how that's a possibility if there's little biological creatures that we haven't discovered that live and hide on this planet somewhere i'm fine with that or big ones if they're bigfoot you know i'm fine with that too but i also think that reality that the universe the cosmos has never showed us anything if it's ever shown us anything 
It shows us that it loves diversity and it loves strangeness. It created colors and sounds and a multitude of animals on one planet and a multitude of uh, chemical compositions and crystals and people all existing on one little planet. It loves strangeness. It loves just making things. And to believe that it didn't make strange things that we have a hard time understanding that we have difficulty in discerning, I think is selling the cosmos short. I think that's a perfect way to end this interview, John. Let's just hope it's more E.T. and less dreams in the witch house. Uh, that, <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 they, you know, that is the wider uh, skew of reality. Okay, before we let you go, though, we got to get you to promise that when you do, so we just had our elves episode. Yeah, we got to uh, talk about week. elves. No, but I'm we got to we got to save it. We got to sa- we got to save it for when he's when he's coming out. So when you eventually do your elves book or you release a new lecture or something like that, you got to come back and give us the full skinny uh, about whatever's going on up by you. I absolutely will. That sounds I, I would great. love that. And and speaking of rock stars, you're a rock star of the paranormal, John Tunney. Absolutely. Whoa. Absolutely. So, um, so the, for Thanks. The, I'm bad with compliments. Thanks. Oh, <laughs> all right. You're welcome. So we're going to have links to all this stuff at othersidepodcast.com slash 176 as we're going to find this. But John, for the people who want to jump on their phone or jump on their computer as soon as they're done listening, where can they find you so they can get some of your stuff? So my website is Weird Lectures. If they go to Facebook, it's facebook.com slash weird lectures. Actually, I tell people the easiest way is go on Google and type uh, Tenny, T-E-N-N-E-Y, and then weirdo after it. <laughs> and then just just follow all of those links straight into whatever crazed rabbit hole it leads you into. All right. Awesome. Thank and this you is so our, much. This is our last episode of 2017. So everybody have an awesome week before New Year. And John, we hope you have an awesome New Year too. Thanks. Happy New Year. Thanks for having me. Well, that was quite the buffet of paranormal discussion. Yes, I agree. Well, okay, now here's the thing. So an article came out in Scientific American uh, right before Christmas, and it talks about one of the things that we were discussing in the podcast, and that's the weird alloys they found. Yeah, yeah. And Because the, the thing is, is that it's not unusual for even really smart people to think that aliens are visiting the planet or that UFOs have aliens and almost everybody believes in life outside the earth. I mean, that's not, yeah. that's not strange. So those things, you know, in the article, they say like, okay, we've had people uh, in the federal government that believe aliens have visited planet earth. Military pilots have recorded videos of UFOs uh, with capabilities that outstrip any capabilities of human aircraft. Okay. That's weird too. And then number three, In a group of buildings in Las Vegas, the government stockpiles alloys and other materials believed to be associated with UFOs. Well, physical evidence, right? That's the, I mean, if we have physical evidence of like some kind of alien technology, I mean, that's the holy grail. That's what we're all looking for. And if they can't explain it, if they have mysterious alloys, um, that's what we're all like, well, there you go. UFOs are real. It's aliens. We got it. So that's pretty, ex- but Scientific American, they're like, they looked into it in the article and metallurgists, well, they don't quite believe that there are alloys that they can't identify. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? So okay, they can use uh, x-rays to see what kind of atoms and the distance between atoms and everything like that in the alloys. So the professor at the Oregon State University Department of Chemistry May Nyman says there are straightforward techniques for identifying metal alloys. And so if one appears, it's simple to figure out what it's made of. For crystalline alloys, those in which the mixture of atoms forms an ordered structure, researchers use a technique called X-ray diffraction. And then she says some sciencey stuff. <laughs> and, but the thing is, if you're a metallurgist or uh, a chemist like this, that's how you figure out what's actually in the alloy. And it's something that any grad student could probably do uh, fairly simply. Okay. And she says, there's no alloys that are sitting in some warehouse that we cannot figure out what they are. In fact, it's pretty simple, and any reasonably good metallurgical grad student can do it for you. Oh, boy. 
All right. I mean, but I do have questions. How has the hunk of metal changed? From my scientist's perspective, that's the kind of question I'd be asking. Maybe, if it has to do with world politics and we want to know where the metal comes from, maybe there's some analysis that can lead you to where it was mined or what country uses that particular alloy, that kind of thing. Now, if it comes from space, there's signs that the alloy would come from space too because we see stuff that comes from space all the time, right? Anything with a meteor. Sure. And plus, we've been to the moon. (laughs) You know, we're taking samples of things on the moon the thing is if it comes from space we can figure that out too sure. so okay uh the fact is it's probably not just the, the composition of the alloys that we can't figure out but going into uh, the article actually says and the author of the article in the new york times blumenthal he confirms it it says that what they were studying was people that said they had experienced physical effects from encounters with the objects and examined them for any physiological changes so the point was not that the alloys themselves might be mysterious. It was that people who had come into contact with the alloys said they had experienced things. Aha. Uh-huh. So well, that's quite a different claim right. than to say that, <laughs> you know, so, they're... <laughs> right. So a lot of the people who are, uh, when they're talking about the article, they're getting it wrong because they're saying, look, we've got, we've got metal from space. We got metal from a spaceship. And that goes to show exactly what it is. And the thing is, people have been claiming we've had metal from spaceships for a long I mean, I remember talking about the uh, Roswell alien autopsy video in like 1997. Yes, and first, I remember that. <laughs> right. And first of all, when you find out the actual history of the alien autopsy video, that can be its own episode we can talk about. But we, I go to this party with Don Schmidt who's been on the show yes. and uh they're like hosting they're hosting a party and don shows up he's the guest of honor because he's got the newest information on roswell and that was actually the first party i went to where somebody asked what my sign was hey man what's your sign and then this guy's like oh you're a scorpio and then went into all this stuff oh, about cool. and i'm like all right that's great Fun. i'm here to t- I'm here to talk about aliens if i wanted in my horoscope i'd read the green sheet and <laughs> green sheet oh my goodness <laughs> And so, <sighs> anyway, but he was talking about how they had recovered some beams or something like that, uh, like little pieces of metal from near the crash site where the crash site was supposedly in Roswell and that they were having it investigated because the alloys were unknown. So they've been talking about this for over 20 years that... Oh my gosh. We might have some weird materials from space, but so, so far... are we putting this to rest? Well, I think what we're trying to put to rest is the idea that you can have some kind of metal that blows our mind. Right. So, so scientists are able to actually find the composition. Yeah, exactly. So we can put to rest the idea that something unidentifiable is even possible. In that, right, in that kind of space. We can't put to rest the notion that people who touched it might have had some weird effects or it was radioactive or... Well, of course, yeah. Or whatever. But um, that's not verifiable. Right, that's anecdotal. I mean, that's empirical yeah. evidence. And of course, in our world, we empirical evidence is something that we take all the time. And John talks about that in the interview, too. Cool. He says that, what, you know, a real takeaway quote that I got from John is when he's like, when other people see stuff, it's not necessarily validation for him because he knows weird stuff exists because he's seen it so it's the val it's it's validation for you so when you have an experience that's validation for you and that's the so yeah. y- you understand that he doesn't just have yeah. to explain the weird stuff he's seen like now you have your own experience right. so we live in the world of empirical uh knowledge and so maybe there is some weird effects that are happening to people who touch the strange alien metal yeah but it's not like we can't figure out what it is the technology is there uh to do that so i thought that was an interesting article in scientific american the truth about alien alloys all right well let's include that in the show notes mike at othersidepodcast.com slash 176 and special thanks to our co-host allison jorinland for joining us this week from milwaukeeghosts.com and also in the show notes is going to be a link where you can listen on your hi-fi to the full quality of the, of our song of the week. Yes. And so this, well, this week's song, this is another quote when we were talking about our conversation with John. Oh, goodness. As we're talking about Tom DeLong. And, and I don't know if they said DeLonge or DeLong, but I don't know if it doesn't really matter. And uh, his To The Stars Academy. And, you know, he does seem like he really cares about this kind of stuff. And I hate to make fun of Tom DeLong. 
because I know he's earnest in it, but he's also using it to make money. And he's got us to the stars like caps and merchandise and stuff. Uh, <laughs> and he's selling his merchandise just like you'd sell band t-shirts, yeah. which is fine. I just totally. think we need to keep that in mind. And if you're going to, you know, if you're still going to try to sell merch and stuff, then we can still make fun of you. And uh, one of the things is I said, like, <clears throat> we talk about Blink-182 and I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, it's pretty much just power chords and poop jokes. <laughs> and... Uh, well, that's the name of this week's song. We decided to do a, a Blink style track <laughs> called Power Chords and Poop Jokes. <laughs> for listening to today's episode. You can find us online at othersidepodcast.com. Until next time, see you on the other side. We've got our last hangout of the year coming up, Mike. Oh, man. That's the last time we get to hang out with our awesome Patreons in 2017? It is. But it means we have a full year of hanging out just around the corner. So I'm really excited this week to catch up with everybody and find out how you know, the month of December went and what everybody's looking forward to in 2018. Yeah, we can discuss everybody's favorite New Year's superstitions, resolutions, uh, plans, dreams, hopes. I'm hoping for disclosure in 2018, obviously. Always, always. As every year. That's happening on Wednesday, December 27th at 7 p.m. Central Time. And if you'd like to join us, you can do that by going to othersidepodcast.com slash donate and uh, join our Patreon community. You can be thanked every week, uh, like our fine Patreon, Dr. Ned. Dr. Ned's at the level where he gets a shout out in every single Ned. episode of See You on the Other Side. So, Dr. Ned, thank you, brother. We hope you have Thanks, Ned. an awesome. He hope you had an awesome Christmas and have the happiest of New Years. And that goes the same to all of you. Uh, and then you can celebrate the holidays with us. Wednesday night, seven p.m. Central Time. OtherSidePodcast dot com slash donate. Our first song with the word poop in the title. Hopefully not our last. Ba-da-ba-ba-da-ba. Oh. <laughs> All right, cool.